what's unique about that is that it allows um, you know both accredited and non-accredited investors to participate. This is a story about a dude named Lane. Then one day he went and tried to rent them out, and then he became one of the man. Hey, Simple Passive Cash Flow listeners. Today we are going to talk about investing in all a bunch of geek stuff like magic cards, Pokemon cards, comic books. So we are talking to the owner, uh, Joe from Mythic Markets. Thanks for coming on, Joe. For sure. Um, so yeah, I'm uh, Joe Mahavutivani, uh, co-founder and CEO of Mythic Markets. And we are essentially creating an investment platform for for geeks, for fans. Um, yeah, so I guess I have to start off with that, you know, this is not, uh, you know, an offering of securities. Uh, we are not soliciting any investments at this moment. Um, we are also not a broker dealer, um, uh, but we do work with one. Um, and uh, yeah, uh, we, I am not a lawyer. I'm not your lawyer. Please can consult your, you know, financial advisor, lawyer, accountants, et cetera, uh, before making any kind of an investment. Yeah, and we've had a lot of, um, you know, we had a few other guys on the show, you know, doing wine, but the difference, the reason why we have to have all this disclaimer stuff is this particular, um, these guys, what they're securitizing the assets. So you as the investor, you can buy like a fractional share of it. As soon as you, we do that, we've kind of triggered securities law and that's why we need to get really, really formal with all this stuff. And, you know, it, this is just like investing in apartment buildings when you don't own the title to the property you own a llc that owns title to said property now you're dealing with security so that's that's why we do it sometimes and that's why we don't do it sometimes but as an investor you need to understand that hey these guys are securitizing the investment they're breaking it up as opposed to i i own actual title to it or i own the actual asset hey joe let's let's kind of talk about a little bit about your story and how you came about you know, starting this company up and I know a lot of people out there that listen a lot of engineers a lot of closet geeks a lot of guys that I'm sure when I meet them we do a lot of networking um, meetups we do like an annual meeting in Hawaii and I'm sure a lot of those guys they'll they'll dress up and go to the San Diego comic-con or all their local ones yeah for sure um, so uh, I guess you know my background is in I've been in startups my entire career primarily on the product and growth side uh, spent the last few years um, on the investing side of the table uh, before starting this company. Um, and, you know, specifically as it pertains to the types of assets that we that we offer on Mythic Markets, uh, I've been a, a, a geek uh, forever. And, uh, you know, specifically for, for us, uh, you know, we started off with Magic Cards and I've been playing Magic since 1994. Uh, in 2002, uh, my collection was stolen when my car was stolen. Um, and you know, the insurance covered about $5,000 of the cards value at that time. But today those cards would be worth on the order of a million dollars. Um, and you know, it's gotten really expensive to sort of bring that collection back together and impractical, but you know, the same thing can be said for comic books, uh, especially being driven by the superhero film genres, making billions of new fans for this, uh, this content and, and this, this intellectual property and, uh, you know, driving, uh, demand for the original stories and the books and and you know these things are you know highly collectible uh, in and of themselves so you know we're starting off with uh, you know as I said the collectible cards the vintage comics um, as well as fantasy art and eventually esports teams and uh, you know all kinds of fandom and and a lot of this stuff is not you know it doesn't cash flow um, this one is definitely simple right I mean you're kind of just a passive investor using the platform but you know, it doesn't, it's not nothing that I invest in personally, but maybe I am definitely interested in personally in the future when I get bored and I'm just looking for cool stuff to do. I think the reason why I bring um, guests like Joe on the podcast is it helps us get out of the, the real estate mode in the box and it kind of brings us into a different investing land and it helps us identify things as an investor that we identify are important to us and evaluate in different investments. And having that different perspective really helps us learn. So first teaching point here, uh, Joe's horrible story there, how he lost his magic card collection that could have been worth a million dollars, could have, could have been um, mitigated by just getting simple insurance. Uh, I got a buddy who got really into selling his 
uh, bas Michael Jordan basketball cards because of the uh, since we're all locked up in the pandemic and everybody was forced to watch The Last Dance, which is the Chicago Bulls documentary. I guess basketball cards, Michael Jordan cards specifically shot up in price. But to me, I was skeptic because it's not insured, right? And I was looking at another deal. It was like a farming deal in a different country. And I was like, dude, this isn't even insured. Like what happens if the thing blows up? Um, whereas, you know, like at apartment buildings, we had several, several fires, lots of them. And a lot of times that's what insurance is for. And I kind of like it when it happens, a little pain, but a lot of times we can make out even better through an insurance settlement and, and come out even stronger from a dollar's perspective what we get. Sorry to derail you there, Joe, but um, yeah, let's, let's kind of get into um, mythic markets this, uh, this platform created. Yeah, I mean, I should also just quickly address sort of the insurance stuff. Like everything is insured. Um, everything is organized in uh, as a company. And so it is our intention to generate revenue with these assets. And uh, through that revenue, eventually like pay out dividends and, and that sort of thing. So um, the intention is for these assets to be self-sustaining businesses in and of themselves. Cool. So like, why would you actually invest in this stuff? Um, in, in truth, the, uh, you know, collectibles uh, like, you know, magic cards or comic books and that sort of thing have outperformed uh, not just the market and gold and real estate, but also alternatives over the last 10 years and, and beyond. And so like, not by, not by a little bit, like by quite a bit. And so, um, you know, but this is an asset class that hasn't been sort of that most people aren't exposed to number one or familiar with, but also because like, you know, in general, this high value stuff, whether it's, you know, collectibles or um, real estate and, and that sort of thing is, is just out of most people's capacity. And certainly um, for some of the blue chip assets uh, that we offer, um, you know, this is certainly true. I mean, most people can't afford, let's say a hundred thousand dollar card or a million dollar comic book. Um, but you know, there is a reason why, uh, you know, high capacity sort of investors do invest in this kind of stuff is because they, um, you know, aside from being diversified in other asset classes, you know, this is something that, um, you know, they may understand better, uh, have more intimate knowledge of, but also that it, it generally out, has outperformed. Of course, like past performance is not indicative of future returns and all that. And, and there's a there's a mainstream advice out there that most investors fly off of, which is you diversify, right? Don't put all your eggs in one year basket. But I forgot who said it. Dale Carnegie it says, "Well, that's stupid." You know, most sophisticated investors invest in one thing that they know, put all their eggs in that basket, and watch that basket like a hawk. So there's kind of two camps out there, and. Uh, Joe knows his magic cards. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's something that I'm super passionate about. I, I would say that I, I would not recommend putting all your eggs in one basket. Um, and I certainly don't. But, uh, you know, if you do have sort of the capacity um, and frankly, like the knowledge and interest and, and all this other stuff, um, you know, these alternatives are a, a great option. Well, I, I mean, I, I guess I shouldn't even say that. Like they are a speculative option, but, um, you know, at least past performance has uh, been, you know, outperformed. And, and a lot of this stuff is not like, look, a lot of you guys listening on the podcast here, you guys are affluent investors. You're investing in the right stuff, building that foundation of cash flow. And a lot of this stuff is more flyers. It's fun, right? Like life's all about having fun after you, you get your bases covered. Um, and a lot of you guys can partake in this type of stuff because you've earned it. You've worked your ass off and you got into a point in life where, you know, you can buy a $200,000 Pokemon. <laughs> I actually was into Pokemon cards. I don't know how to play them, but I knew like when I was like nine, we would buy these cards and I knew like you could, you'd buy a pack for five bucks and the stars were, you could sell them for $5 and there was usually a star card in each pack. Sometimes you get a foil card, but that's all I know. But I, I it's a nostalgia thing, right? Like there, there definitely is an element of n nostalgia, but um, you know, I, I will say that like, you know, these are trading card games. Um, the word trading sort of right in them. You can follow like even the, the daily, uh, value or of, of any of these cards on a number of websites. Um, and this stuff changes hands very frequently, um, mostly offline, you know, as people are trading in, in shops and stuff like that, you know, here's a $5 card for, you know, 
two dollar fifty cent cards and so forth. Um, and uh, you know, this happens all the time offline. Um, and so, in some ways, they are sort of traded like unregulated securities already. We are ha- we just happen to be doing that at sort of the the high end. So, for instance, like you know, a ninety thousand dollar Black Lotus card. Um, which is something that even if you're not familiar with magic, you may be familiar with the Black Lotus, for instance. Um, or if you're ha- you happen to be, you know, a, a fan of Pokemon, you might have spent five dollars on that pack of cards and cracked open a, a twenty dollar card, for instance. And you know, uh, on top of that, there is sort of the utility of the value of those cards in the game. And so, for instance, Black Lotus happens to be a very powerful magic card that you used to be able to buy in like a three dollar pack of cards what um, the heck does the black lotus do, do because i saw this is where i first got interested in this stuff maybe five ten years ago i saw a youtube video that went viral of yeah. this guy like he unpacked he's just going through his cards he's flipping it in his hand this is way before unboxing was popular but he just like lost his s <laughs> he got the the black lotus card and he's like oh my god oh my god <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Um, so that was that that video is, I mean, amazing to see something like that being opened from a, from, you know, for, uh, being pack fresh as they as they call it. Um, and so, you know, that card specifically uh, at the time, I think was worth like 25 grand. Um, that was maybe seven years ago. And uh, today, probably closer to 400, maybe maybe more. Um, 400,000, uh, but, uh, depending on, I think it came back in nine, five highly graded card in any case, uh, to answer your question, a black Lotus, essentially the, these games are, you know, you take turns playing cards and casting spells and trying to beat your opponent. Right. And so essentially what a black Lotus does is give you a three turn head start in terms of like your resources. Um, you know, you can play like one resource a turn, one land a turn, uh, but a, lo- a Black Lotus essentially gives you three mana of any color, of, of a single color of any color. And, you know, you can cast something that costs three more mana much faster than than your opponent. It's it's amazing. It's amazingly powerful. It seems very, very simple, and it is. But it's outrageously powerful. Apparently, it's worth as much as, like, a nice single-family home, median family home in Alabama. <laughs> um, for, yeah. For a really cool car. Yeah. You and I. <laughs> I mean, as the, throughout the years, as the game has grown, and and true true of whether it's Pokemon, comics, esports, whatever it happens to be, as the fandoms continue to grow throughout through the years, um, the stuff becomes more valuable, becomes more rare, um, becomes uh, you know as a result becomes more out of reach for people. So Magic's been around for um, you know twenty uh, seven years now, um, and. And so, you know, the, the player base and the, the fan base has grown, you know, immensely throughout the years. And similarly with Pokemon, Pokemon's the number one highest grossing franchise ever. And then, you know, similarly with, with comic books. I mean, as you go and watch the films, this stuff becomes more and more popular. So um, ultimately, you know, we have structured these uh, as a regulation A+, plus, um, specifically tier two public offerings. And this allows, what's unique about that is that it allows, um, you know, both accredited and non-accredited investors to participate. So in like a typical, let's say, real estate deal um, that you may be accustomed to, uh, you know, whether it's, you know, there's a lot of uh, platforms out there for buying fractional ownership in real estate. You know, you those are probably either a, you know, reg crowdfunding, well, probably not reg crowdfunding. Yeah, but mostly like five, reg, the reg, D. reg D, 506B or C. And that requires you to be an accredited investor. No, yeah. So most of those, but like ninety to ninety-seven percent of real estate deals, which is a little bit misnomer, um, are for non-accredited investors too. You just have to be in a network. You have to know who you're dealing with. As soon as like you mass market out to the average Joe, it can only go out to accredited investors. So those right. are typically not the good deals, in my opinion, because they're kind of fishing for investors. But. Right. So Reg A Plus allows um, not just the accredited and non-accredited investors, but also for sort of this general solicitation, um, allowing you know you to um, essentially advertise these things uh, in a similar way as like Reg crowdfunding uh, would allow you. But then that had other uh, you know investment guide rails for Reg crowdfunding and and also investing limits. Um, Reg A Plus allows uh, you know, up to $50 million, uh, specifically tier two allows up to $50 million to be raised for any, you know, raisings like qualified under that particular 
Reg A plus filing. And so for instance, like, you know, in the previous slide, you know, there's the $90,000 Lotus and the $200,000 Pokemon card and, you know, the comics and so forth, you know, that, you know, with that, it comes nowhere near $50 million. And so we can put quite a few things under that, uh, into that single filing. Yeah. And, and those of you guys are investing in AHP, they, they have a regulation A plus offering. I don't know if it's a tier one or I think they're tier two. So I'm not too familiar with this, so I might misquote it, but I believe tier one are lower thresholds. You can only raise up to a certain amount. And 20 million, I believe. And you don't need an auditor, but the one you guys are doing are the bigger one, 20 million and over, but you need a third party auditor. We are audit. Yeah. All of our um, offerings are audited. Yeah, but we do I, annual audits. But the trouble with the reg A plus offering is it takes a lot longer than a 506 B or C to originate it's a lot more paperwork and it's a lot more costly. Like we normally get our PPMs done on the 506 B and C stuff for like, you know, like 10 grand on that magnitude. But the reggae plus is probably about five times as much as that. At least. Yeah. But the nice thing is, you know, you, you can buy all kinds of cards under the sun, all kinds of assets. And it's just one PPM. You're done. And I think you can you can keep it over for what like a year and a half, a couple of years. Yeah. So I mean, technically, it's not a PPM. Like I mean, it's not it's not private. But yeah. Uh, yeah. You know, from your perspective, it's all that the lawyers do. All the paperwork <laughs> they do is just you just have to pay them fifty grand one time. That's the important uh, thing. I, I will say that we've invested a lot more than fifty thousand dollars, and uh, and more importantly, like time into kind of bringing all this together. Yeah. I mean, we're we're here uh, to you know, to build a business for the long term, And um, that is what we're doing. But I think if from an investor's perspective, it, it's important to know the structure and how you're, you're raising money. Because if you're working with an operator who just, they don't have answers to these kind of questions, you want to run away as quickly as possible because they're doing it illegally. You know, if they don't have the money, the 50, 100 grand to do one of these documents, maybe and they probably shouldn't be in business in the first place. You shouldn't be. Yeah. So, so, so we are regulated by the SEC, as you as you pointed out, and um, and so we have a qualified, uh, you know, public filings um, available on the SEC Edgar website, um, and we amend those uh, from time to time. And then we also have, uh, you know, FINRA no objections, and um, you know, gone through all that process. Um, and so, you know, so the way that this ultimately works is that we acquire these, um, you know, in our case, like high value collectibles. Um, and, uh, you know, we wrap them in a company, uh, specifically a series LLC, and that's what's broken up into shares securitized with reggae plus. And then we, you know, it's basically like 80% or so to an actual IPO, like, you know, being able to take like Uber or public or whatever, um, smaller scale, obviously, but, uh, you know, there is a ton of work involved to do that. And so, um, you know, we are, uh, you know, doing those IPOs, those public offerings. Um, and then we are in the process of enabling that last part, which is trading. And so uh, that's something that is a priority for the next, uh, you know, t through the end of the year is our, is our priority. And so, um, you know, ultimately what people are investing in are, you know, in sort of lay terms, like shares of a company that owns the, the, the asset. So in our case, you know, a membership interest is the shares, the shares of the um, of the LLC, which is the series LLC, and the asset is that underlying asset. In this case, in this case, let's say like a Black Lotus or the Pokemon card or the comic book, etc. And so, ultimately, you are investing in, you know, series, let's say Alpha Black Lotus or series, you know, uh, Pikachu Illustrator, series uh, Amazing Fantasy Fifteen. You're investing in shares of that, and that company owns that that card or comic book or whatever the asset happens to be. So um, just to, you know, for, for clarity, you are not, you know, buying a page of that comic book, for instance. Um, uh, you are buying a share of the company that owns that th and maintains that thing. And so, you know, this is an overview of how everything's sort of organized. The Mythic Collection is the company that is making these offerings, is, is what's called the issuer. Um, and, uh, you know, as I mentioned, sort of the series structure below that, um, you know, you have the Lotus and, and basically everything else that would fall under that. And so that is managed by what's called the manager up top. 
And that is uh, our company that develops the software and employs our team and engineers and so forth. But, um, you know, these offerings are made by, uh, you know, Mythic Collection. And, and, and ultimately, like, if, you know, someone wants to acquire the asset, like, you know, that is, uh, you know, the company uh, sells the asset at, you know, whatever the agreed upon um, price is, and, and especially based on, like, the uh, shareholder sentiment. Um, and then, uh, and then the, the company is, the asset is sold and the company is dissolved. But yeah, I mean, we don't expect that that will be the primary form of liquidity. Um, as I mentioned, we are building, uh, that trading piece in the next uh, quarter or two. So that, that's, that's coming soon. So, um, uh, right now, for those of you guys watching on the YouTube, we have the org chart. It's kind of like an org chart, but how the, uh, Mythic Collection LLC, um, is sort of the manager of the underlying assets, you know, just what you call it Black Lotus card one, Black Lotus card two, Pokemon card 550 or whatever are the assets underlying. So, so right now the LLC is structured to hold on to those assets and it's managed by the manager. I think a lot of times investors, they kind of key in on, oh, what's the structure? What's the structure? Um, to me, I don't, I mean, it's the structure that the lawyer put together that, you know, made the, the sense for the management of the assets. Um, this is very, it looks very familiar to um, blind pool funds where there's quite a few assets in there and it's an open load and open, you know, assets are coming in at different times and also exiting at different times. But the unique thing about this sort of deal is if you can explain a little bit better, Joe, but the trading aspect, how do you, um, assets, come in and out right yeah so i mean i guess you know the reason why just as an overview why it's structured this way is that for instance each of the series each of the assets are um uh are essentially shielded from liability from each other if if for instance one the value of one goes up or let's say the value of one goes down um uh you know it's shielded from every other deal um and so you know it's it's important to kind of keep these walls up between you know, the investors of each of these companies, right? So um, not just to protect these other companies, but also to protect the, um, the uh, like, the, let's say the series Black Lotus itself. Um, in terms of like the trading, as you were uh, alluding to, so we were working with a broker-dealer partner um, to implement their uh, alternative trading system. And, uh, and all of that's been FINRA approved at this stage. Uh, and so we are building that, um, you know, as, as we speak now. Uh, and so you, as I mentioned, are uh, uh, buying shares in each one of these LLCs or whatever one you, that you specifically want to invest in. So you own shares uh, in that LLC. And the uh, ATS, the, the trading system, will allow you to um, essentially, you know, list those in sort of a bid-ask marketplace and uh and be able to sell those shares to other investors much like you know how the traditional stock market works and so yeah it operates much the same way all under the, the umbrella of the company or the manager on you guys so we we host that that marketplace so you know you'd be able, at this stage only be able to trade let's say um you know shares in that black lotus or um you know, the, the Pokemon card or the comic book or what have you um, on Mythic Markets. And so, yeah, that's where we are um, making that available. So as a fintech company, they're creating a marketplace, which is it's part of the value add because, you know, if you're just running around to uh, magic card conventions, especially when there's not, not people meeting out in the public during COVID, um, it can be a very fragmented market, whereas you guys are kind of making it more of a, a liquid market. Yeah. And so, you know, the thing is, is that the, the increased liquidity is ultimately coming from being just within reach. Because if, if you think about it, like there is no shortage of, you know, people at, you know, shows, for instance, like uh, conventions, whether it's Comic-Con or whether it's, um, you know, Magic Fest or whether it's what, whatever it happens to be, there's like a lot of the the collectibles swapping hands at these things and you know generally like let's say like that that magic card that black lotus um you'll have people at these shows like moving cash around and um and so you know that's going to be you know for only for people who have the capacity to um be able to to take part 
uh, liquidity is, you know, increased with us in the sense that, you know, you could buy a share for like $40 or whatever the, the share price happens to be and participate, um, you know, and not have to come out of pocket for $90,000 or whatever. Yeah, we're trying to eliminate the, uh, the magic card trader with his fanny pack walking around with several <laughs> grand in his pocket, right? <laughs> yeah, I mean, look, if we look at my own personal example, um, you know, I used to keep my cards in my car, including several Lotuses and, um, you know, other really expensive cards because they just went in my deck. I played with them um, and people still do. Uh, but as it's been shown, at least in my case, it's this stuff disappears pretty easily and quickly. And um, it hurts a lot <laughs> when, when it happens. And it happens more often than you would think. I mean, once this stuff is slabbed in like hard plastic cases, it's essentially been relegated to art. Um, and unless you destroy that case uh, in general, you are, that, that thing is never gonna breathe fresh air again. This is super rare stuff. And uh, uh, to some, you know, may believe that it belongs in a museum, as uh, Indiana Jones likes to say. So, so the stuff, Talk to us a little about the storage of these assets and then are, and then they, how are they insured to? Uh, so I guess that first part, just because we've been talking about it. Um, so we have an insurance policy that covers the um, entire collection um, and we continue to amend that insurance policy as we get new things uh, in the collection. And we store all of our stuff. I'm, I'm here in California, but we store everything uh, out of state for tax purposes. And so we don't you know, generally reveal like where that is just, because you know it's a storage like vaulting facility, and, and that you know as an investor you want to be able to know that you're you're insured for the uh, the end of the world event you know let's just mm -hmm. like apartment buildings fire or whatever hurricanes anything you can say about like the validity of the product like how do you know you're not getting like a fake black lotus? Sure. Um, so like there are grading and authentication services that independently will you know you you send them the the, the card or the comic book or, or whatever. And they will uh, essentially, you know, validate that those things are real. Like they're not infallible, but they're, they're like very, very good. And so they will not only authenticate um, and, and then they'll apply a grade. So they'll grade things like the, the quality of the, and, and how pristine the surfaces and the corners and, you know, whatever, like any damage um, uh, centering, basically like, you know, uh, applying, um, a grade so that you can kind of, you know, know where your particular asset sits in the universe of similar assets. And so, um, you know, for instance, with cards, BGS uh, uh, and PSA are sort of the popular ones. Uh, BGS was, uh, is Beckett. And, and so for those, you know, who might have collected in the past, um, they know that Beckett is is a uh, you know used to put out those price guides and stuff like that, um, and then uh, CGC and and others also do comics. Yeah, so there are services that will you know authenticate and, and grade and and all that other stuff, and then others that will appraise. And you can also find um, you know we we base our sort of I guess appraisals based on uh, comparables in the market, just like you would for real estate. And um, uh, and you can kind of find a lot of these things transacting um, online, but I would say that the vast majority of the tra the transactions are happening offline. Yeah, and I've I've told this story a, a couple times to folks, but they, I was looking into buying some life settlement investments, um, one off deals. You know, you're essentially just buying a piece of paper, a contract, and as an investor, I wasn't able to validate if the paper was legit or not. There's no barcode. There's you know you couldn't really call up the surfacer and say is it real, and that was what made me uncomfortable and why I didn't put any more time. I mean, I probably didn't put as much time as I'd like to because I got busy with the real asset investing. But it's what that's it's. I just wanted to highlight that because it's it's kind of the same exact thing we're talking about here. How do you make sure that your asset is legitimate? And just like when you buy a house or an apartment building, there's a title. You know, that's why it's so nice to invest in the United States because less paperwork is defined. Yeah. So, um, uh, I mean, all of this, as I mentioned, is, you know, designed to, you know, uh, 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 you know, fit within like sort of the regulatory environment uh, in the U.S. And so, you know, I think it's a probably a good time to mention that these are actual securities. You're buying actual, you know, shares of a company. Um, actual stock 
versus like, you know, this is not crypto or blockchain or sort of any, um, anything like that. Uh, so there is definitely like a securities framework around all of this. Um, Can you in go into like, you know, you mentioned the Beckett guide for like baseball cards and basketball cards. Wasn't there some kind of like a, a controversy? Like it's, it's a sort of a conflict of interest, right? That they're grading their own cards. Wasn't there something that came out? A while I mean, ago on Beckett stuff? doesn't make their own, as far as I know, like print their own cards. But I, I suppose that there's probably like um, a way for them to sort of be in cahoots with uh, the people who are sending like, you know, the, the, the major dealers and stuff like that, um, as well as the, the publishers of this stuff, I, I would imagine. But I'm not aware of like anything that, that there was any kind of con controversy around um, those companies okay. themselves, though. Okay. So yeah, so, so so trading is like the number one by far our number one uh, uh, most requested feature, and so that's something that we're working on right now. Um, and you know, these are all just concepts that you're seeing right now, but um, you know, will work essentially the same way. Um, and uh, you know, so that's something that we're enabling through our broker dealer and uh, their alternative trading system. So we'll be enabling that um, you know hopefully by end of year at the very latest, but. Uh, you know, like I said, these things generally take a lot longer um, to kind of put together uh, just because it's, it's such a heavily regulated business and, um, and these are actual securities. And so, yeah, I mean, it's like a, essentially a bid ask marketplace. And so, you know, it's, uh, you know, if someone says like, if you bought shares in, let's say the Lotus at $45 and you want to list it for sale at like $50, well, somebody else has to come in and, and be willing to pay you $50 for um, you know, those shares, for instance. And so, um, yeah, I mean, I guess much like the stock market, but I would say like lower cap, obviously, and there will be, you know, limited volume, at least at the, at the outset. But, you know, that's something that we're building up over time. Sort of like an eBay, but for cards. Right. Well, well but for securities. Yeah. Of securities those, of yeah. cards. Yeah. Fractional ownership of cards. Are there mm -hmm. any time in like, you know, like the past handful of years where like some, some event has happened where greatly impacted the price of the cards, individual cards that go up or down. Like, cause I think mean, this is the fun part, right? I mean, this whole, you know, the reason why you do this cause it's fun. And, you know, I can see like, like basketball cards, like, you know, if LeBron James wins another championship with LA, he might even be the, you know, the goat, right? Greatest of all time, better than Michael Jordan. You know, there's a lot of arguments there that his card might go up in value. It, is there anything you can kind of point to that things have happened in the industry that push certain items higher or lower? Absolutely. So, um, you know, you give a great example with like, you know, the Jordan stuff, like Jordan stuff has increased two or three times since, uh, since the last dance came out, for instance, but I'll give you an example, like from our fandoms. So, uh, Wonder Woman, the first Wonder Woman book uh, was, you know, maybe a $25,000 comic book or $10,000, whatever it happens to be. Like there's also different grades and so forth. But, um, you know, a high grade version of that sold for about $930,000 uh, two months after the movie came out. Because, you know, before the movie came out, first of all, nobody was as aware or as familiar or, you know, found Wonder Woman to be as pop popular as she became after the movie came out. And so suddenly you had a worldwide audience and fan base of probably billions of people. And so that book skyrocketed in value because the, the film was, was so popular. And then, you know, on the flip side, you know, and also like, you know, to that end, you know, we saw the same things happen with, you know, Black Panther and, you know, Infinity War and stuff like that. Maybe not to the degree that Wonder Woman did, but um, certainly like the, the movies the, the, are, are driving a lot of that fervor around um, and, and demand around those origination stories. Um, on the other hand, you know, Justice League is another one where it just fell kind of flat and, and uh, didn't really help the book much at all. Um, you know, but, uh, you know, a lot of it is dependent on sort of the popularity of these, uh, these, these games and these fandoms and, and stories. Like Fantastic Four, buy them now, right? Because you can't get any worse than the last movies. Well, I, I mean, so that's a great example. So, I mean, we actually, um, you know, did recently pick up uh, a copy of uh, Fantastic Four. 
Um, and you know, we'll be making an offer, offering that soon. Um, now that the MCU and frankly Disney owns everything, including uh, the Fantastic Four, X Men, and a lot of other IP that they didn't have before, um, you know, the expectation is that as they're integrated into the MCU, that you know they make amazing films. And so certainly, I think a lot of people are betting on that uh, to, 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 to drive the value of these, um, these collectibles. Now, I'm going to ask you a, a jerk question. People <laughs> always ask this to me. They, they, they'll say like, oh, with COVID-19, people won't want to live in apartments anymore. You know, I'm like, really? Like, <laughs> but like, what is, what is, what, do you see any kind of scenario where, Maybe they flood the whole market with a whole bunch of like collectibles or a lot of these items aren't going to be worth. They, the price will go down, I guess. Um, so we haven't or seen Or is it that. just a blank, blank uh, stare and like, all right, do what you've been doing then, whatever. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, you know, I think that it depends. Uh, so, for instance, like we haven't seen that so far. We've seen more dollars flowing into... Um, sort of alternative assets investing, uh, especially as like, you know, and by the way, like, I don't know that you can print trillions of dollars without affecting like the, the, the value of cash, for instance, but, um, you know, certainly like people are looking for other places to put their money, um, you know, right now. And so uh, I don't know necessarily how that pertains to apartments. I mean, I can tell you that here in the Bay Area, like rents have fallen. Um, because people are leaving the Bay Area if you don't have to live to live here to work here or, or at a Bay Area company. Um, but um, so I, I can't really comment on that. But at least with collectibles, we've seen an increase in uh, in demand for this stuff. And and also on the flip side, too, where people need to get some liquidity right now, you're seeing a lot of people, um, you know, get out of their, uh, you know, collectible positions. Um, so, yeah, ho hopefully that answers your question. <laughs> well, the people who ask those kind of questions are the guys who never do anything anyway. Let them have their thoughts. Yeah, I mean, I, I think um, everyone's in sort of a different financial position, especially right now, where uh, you know people are very uncertain um, about you know what's going to happen. You know, being an election year, for instance, that that would certainly have an effect. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, I think that there's just a lot of uncertainty. Um, and so also, you know, with everybody cooped up at home, one thing that people are gravitating to is, is comfort, is nostalgia, is entertainment. And so, you know, you're seeing, for instance, like online games skyrocket in terms of like their, um, their, their popularity and demand. Similarly, like with, you know, the, the, the digital versions of like magic, for instance, is like crazy popular. Um, you know, because you're not going to your local game stores to play cards anymore or to the mall or wherever and hanging out with your friends. And so, um, so, so that's certainly like driving a lot of this. Yeah. I know we're super popular these days are like board game bars. So popular. Right. Uh, so in the city, like we've got a few of those and they're, it's actually really hard to get a seat. I mean, I imagine right now, I, I mean, I think this thing's going to ruin a lot of those kinds of businesses, at least in the short term. But, uh, uh, I, you know, I, I think like, you know, we are, we're all looking for like third places and I think third places will become, um, you know, more popular as work from home becomes more popular. Uh, you know, whether it's a coffee shop or like a bar or like, a, 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 a you know, a game store to hang out with your friends, whatever it happens to be. Once people get comfortable hanging out with their friends, uh, I think those will become more and more popular. Yeah, I totally agree. I, I got to get out of the house. I mean, yeah, that's why I'm joining a club too. For sure. Uh, so you got a slide up right now for, you know, sort of an example of, of what happens, let's say, if we liquidate the entire asset. So if we get somebody, somebody that comes in and says, hey, I really want to buy that, you know, let's say that Pikachu Illustrator card um, that was 220000 It's probably close to like 250 maybe 300 now. Um, and, and it's actually, actually a population of five. And so, um, you know, somebody comes in and says like, hey, I want to offer you, let's say it's like, you know, let, let's just use these numbers here, for example. Um, you know, it's, it's on Mythic Markets, it's, you know, trading for $80,000 for whatever the uh, example is. And there's 2,000 shares. So the, the share price currently would be $40. Um, 
if there was 2000 shares, if somebody comes in and says, Hey, I want to pay $125,000 for that thing. There's like a 50% or so premium, um, sort of like comparable to somebody coming in and, and taking a public company private, for instance. Um, and so there'd be, might be a premium, a premium on, on shares. Um, you know, aside from sort of like, you know, cost to, to wind down the company, to do all the accounting and also this stuff, um, you know, the, the, uh, you know, you, that would all be factored into whatever the, um, you know, the payout per share price is, but you know, the proceeds from that sale would go toward the, uh, shareholders of that, um, of that asset, uh, pro rata. So based on whatever their ownership happens to be. So, um, yeah, I mean, this is a, an oversimplified example, but you know, essentially that's how it would work. So we understand the, um, you guys are the kind of the, the house. How does the house kind of keep the, the lights on and facilitate this marketplace? What's, what is the kind of, the, is it asset management fee or? So if you actually go to the next slide, awesome. Uh, so, so how does Mythic Markets make money ultimately? Um, so number one is not from trading fees. So we are not a broker dealer, um, and we cannot accept anything that even resembles, uh, a, you know, a commission for trading. Um, and so, uh, so it's not from that. So ultimately our core business is going to be around sort of this premium subscription model, um, that, you know, will be similar. We envision to be like, uh, like Robin Hood gold. If you're familiar with Robin Hood, um, you know, uh, not necessarily like options trading and margin trading and stuff, uh, but, uh, uh, you know, potentially pro trading tools, um, early access to the IPOs, um, you know, and, and, uh, you know, opportunities to, uh, you know, visit the collection and experience the collection, um, and, and all kinds of other benefits that we are currently still putting together. Um, and so, you know, with each IPO, there is a, you know, a, a nominal sourcing fee that is included. Um, and that covers some of the costs to bring, bring that offering to market. And generally, like historically has been about 2%. Um, and then, you know, we also co-invest in every single deal. So, um, you know, if you're, although these are uh, structured as like a series LLC and as a company and, you know, intended to generate revenue, um, the... Uh, uh, mythic markets essentially co-invest in each of these things as um, if you're familiar with like a fund structure, sort of like a GP and LP sort of relationship. Uh, but you know, this aligns our interests with the, uh, the investors as well. And so we hold that until any kind of a liquidity event. And then, uh, and then what's called free cash flow. Ultimately this is serves as like a potential management fee. And so like, for instance, um, you know, we intend to, have these at like a gallery or a show or sponsored or whatever it happens to be. And half of that revenue is split equally between, um, the, the series, uh, meaning like to run that business and then with, um, the shareholders as a dividend. So for instance, if we take in $10,000 as part of like a, uh, a gallery, um, you know, ticket sales or whatever it happens to be, um, you know, half of that would go to the, um, to, as the, like a management fee, so like five thousand dollars, and then half of that would go to um, the shareholders as a dividend, and um, and that'd probably be paid out semi annually or annually. So still working that particular piece out. But I will say that we do not take any kind of a uh, you know management fee on if the asset is sold, if that if that makes sense. No distribution so, fee. Right. So, so in the previous example, like, you know, that $5,000, like, or I guess that, um, uh, yeah. So like the $45,000 Delta, we're not taking 22 five of that, for instance. Um, that is all generally going back to the, the shareholders. So the sourcing fee in a way that's, that's kind of your, your matchmaker fee or acquisition fee. What, what percent is that normally of the asset or is it more on a fix? Yes. No, so so it depends. Um, but in general, historically, it's been about two percent. No, which is pretty much in line with you know trading any kind of asset out there. Yeah. So again, this is not a trading fee of any kind. Um, this is basically covering, you know, all of the legal expense, all of the expense of you know basically going out and uh, you know transporting and and you know bringing that to our vault and and also this stuff to. Uh, you know, cover some of those costs, but not I will say a, that not just a bunch of dudes playing magic cards. You guys are busy. <laughs> <laughs> right. Exactly. 
Um, so, uh, yeah, I mean, that's, it's, I, I would say, I will say that like our actual fees are far greater than the sourcing fee would offset. It's something that we uh, include to help cover some of those costs. And, and this is interesting that you guys are doing like the co-investing model. Um, when you, so when you guys go into a deal, you, in a way you guys are, it's like sponsoring an apartment deal. Um, the general partner is also putting some money in the LP side. Is there a normal like minimum you guys will do of the, uh, the total money needed or is it you, you guys pick and choose too or? So, um, yeah, our offering documents, uh, you know, mandate that we pick up a minimum of 2%. In general, um, you know, it is far more than 2%. Um, and so, you know, right now, like we are taking up to 10%. Um, but, you know, it just, it just depends on the, um, the, the offering. Uh, but yeah, I mean, I think like we're averaging right now about like 8% as a co-investment but in general like if you look at any sort of a fund structure uh the gps are putting in you know around like five percent exactly exactly and that's what the, the teaching point i wanted to pull out you know for apartment buildings different asset class different type of investment altogether but normally if like for a un, like a like a newer operator you know you want to see more than 10 20 percent of skin in the game i think five to ten percent is for what most guys are doing um, but yeah, you know, right in line with, with that guidance. Um, cool. Yeah. So like you said, this is totally our, our skin in the game. Um, and, you know, uh, incentive, I mean, it ultimately aligns our interests with all of the investors. Yeah. And, and I think that by aligning interests with them, you guys are cherry picking assets to bring into the collection, right? Like you guys aren't going to pick up, I don't know, like Captain America, right? There's not going to be any more movies coming out supposedly well i mean who knows if that's a guess right but like if that's all indicated you guys wouldn't buy any of those assets right i mean i, I, don't, I don't know what would be a good example no no i mean i think that like actually makes the you know if i were to speculate i would i would say that that probably increases the value of those assets um, oh yeah yeah you're right you're right so uh, yeah i mean captain america hugely popular um not just that there is now a new captain america um, and so, uh, although it differs, the stories differ, you know, in terms of like the sequential order of who that Captain America is in the MCU versus like the comic books, um, it, there, there are still sort of the origin stories, let's say for this new Captain America. And so, um, but like the original, like the original is not going anywhere. Like ultimately, like, you know, if this new Captain America and all subsequent Captain Americas are popular or, you know, more, even more popular, that actually you know, I would say probably drives the, the value of the, those earlier origin stories well, sort of as they continue like bearing that torch forward. I, I think it proves my point. I don't know what the heck I'm talking about, right? As an investor, <laughs> <laughs> but, and that, and that's why I think this business model fixed because you guys know a lot more than us sitting here and therefore you guys should be making the decisions just like an apartment deal where, I mean, what are the, the LPs don't know what's happening in that market. A lot of times they haven't even visited the market themselves. They don't know. You know, you guys are kind of driving the ship. Uh, whereas another, I mean, we just had the, the wine people on talking about that investment. Their business plan is different. So they'll charge, it just, I think it was a straight 2%, 2.5% um, asset management fee. And they're like, look, you, you guys pick whatever you guys want, whether it's garbage or really good or it's trending upward or down, downwards. Look, we're just uh, here to uh, facilitate your trade for you. Uh, whereas I think you guys are co-investing side and you know it can go up and can go down, but people like that they're investing along with somebody who supposedly knows more than they do, but there's a, uh, you know, there's a performance split, right? You guys get compensated when the deal goes well, as opposed to the other guys they're like, look, you guys make your own decision. You guys are on your own home. Well, well, I mean, compensated in a sense, right? Like, because we're co-investing, like, if the if the asset does well, like, we do well. And so it's in our best interest to, like, pick well. Yeah. And so... Um, I think it's you know, fair. I mean, I think, like, from an investor's perspective, you can't have both. You can't have just a straight asset management fee and have these guys curate your investments for you. They're not going to do that for free. So, I mean, coming from venture, uh, venture capital, like this is not unlike that, right? Like we have limited capital to make 
investments in startups and we want to make the best investments possible um you know for the potential of returning capital to our investors which so you know you've probably heard of like two and 20s for instance um you know there's that two percent you know sort of annual management fee for like capital that's been deployed and then 20 percent on any capital returned and so, um, you know, you align the incentives, like you just have some, some operating capital, but the real money comes in, you know, 10 plus years for that, uh, any particular fund that is, um, you know, returning more capital than it took in for that fund. And, and so, ultimately, that's how the, your platform, that's the, that's the overarching thing is going to get popular is how people make money off of it for them to, you know, have a good experience and need to make money. So I guess it makes sense while you guys drive the ship in a, in a way. Yeah, I mean, I think like ultimately um, it, it, it sort of cuts both ways. We want to pick things that have historically performed well. Um, you know, there are some probably like flyer type bets on, you know, um, let's say a comic book for a new franchise that hasn't been proven yet, for instance, um, you know, will like nobody knew that Guardians of the Galaxy was going to blow up like it did. Like Guardians is like super obscure. Um, and most people had no idea who the Guardians were, but everybody knew who X-Men, the X-Men were. Um, I don't know about you, but I used to watch that X-Men animated series as a kid and it has the world's greatest sort of opening theme song. But the movies didn't do half as well as let's say Iron Man. Even Iron Man was kind of like um, obscure. And so, uh, you know, I think like a lot of this is being driven by, you know, what's going on in pop culture today, you know, so, so we are trying to find assets that um, either head those off has historically performed and actually in terms of historical performance, um, you know, has been moving up and to the right over time. And so, you know, any investment you should generally look at as, you know, being long on, um, and so we, you know, sort of uh, provide data for as far back as we can get it, um, but at minimum of 10 years. So like, I'll say that, like, for instance, our last uh, asset that closed um, as of this podcast about a week and a half ago, um, you know, is, uh, is an asset that I think has been increasing about 28 or so percent year on year compounding. And so, um, yeah, it's done pretty well, I will say. Cool. Yeah, we. Um, I think a lot of people got a lot of insights out of not only investing, but you know, your, your what you guys are up to. Uh, once you give your folks your contact information, um, or just the URL for to to, to check this thing out. Sure. Um, so the company is called Mythic Markets. We are at mythicmarkets.com. Um, if you go to the bottom, I think there's probably a, a link there too. Uh, and you know, so that's my email. Happy to um, you know talk to anybody who is interested in um, in the platform. Happy to answer any questions that you might have. Um, and uh, yeah, we're excited to continue bringing um, you know all aspects of pop culture to uh, you know make that investable. And um, yeah, we're we're super excited to do it. Yeah, let me know if something cool comes up, like Thor's real hammer or something like that. Sound breaker. <laughs> That'd so, cool. so, I mean, there are, there are that, that may be a new sort of frontier for us, certainly. Um, but I will say the next thing that we are preparing to launch is Amazing Fantasy 15, which is the very first Spider-Man. Um, and uh, that's super exciting for, for yeah. us. I like a lot of like Final Fantasy, like, like the video game stuff, like Chrono Trigger. And I'm a huge Mono. RPG fan myself. Yeah. And I could geek out with you all day on that. Yeah. But you guys aren't training any kind of that stuff. So you mean in terms of like the video games? Or... Yeah, yeah. I'm not too big of a comic guy. I mean, I like the MCU movies for sure, but like, like, like the video game. That's what I grew up with, right? I mean, I, everybody says, "Oh, you live in Hawaii, you surf." Like, <laughs> no, I was just some engineer guy who just had to study all the time and played my video games and ate junk food. I mean, video yeah. games is another like potential asset class for us, right? So like, like for instance, an original sealed Super Mario Brothers, I think uh, is like $100,000. Um, as a fan of like Final Fantasy, I, I got introduced to it uh, uh, with Final Fantasy 2, uh, US 2 and 3, um, 4 and 6 in Japan. Uh, and then obviously 7, 7's the new remake is, is out now, um, at least the first part of it. 
and um, you know, continuing to build renewed interest in in these franchises. And so, um, yeah, I mean, just like the films, like there's a lot of stuff driving the popularity of these franchises today. I'll tell you what, like you know that Final Fantasy three. I don't know what it was in Japan, but the, uh, that six. was six. But like my game like glitched. This is my claim to fame when I was before I turned age of twenty. It was I had that game and it glitched. And you know that Paladin Shield? It was some like it was like a super item, right? It glitched and I got ninety nine of them. Nope. <laughs> I bet that thing would that'd be worth a lot of money. I don't know if you could. It, well, if you could sell digital assets back then, probably right. Yeah. Like uh, that's what happens sometimes when you uh, use the game genie. Or I might be dating myself with that reference, but oh yeah, yeah, the whole yeah. But this is there was no game game genie involved in this, and it was just full on like luck of the draw. But yeah, yeah, but cool, man. Um, we'll, we'll keep going on this later, but people are probably falling asleep where they're <laughs> super interested. <laughs> but yeah, appreciate it, Joel. Thank you for having me. This website offers very general information concerning real estate for investment purposes. Every investor situation is unique. Always seek the services of licensed third-party appraisers and inspectors to verify the value and condition of any property you intend to purchase. Use the services of professional title and escrow companies and licensed tax, investment, and or legal advisor before relying on any information contained herein. Information is not guaranteed as in every investment there is risk. The content found here is just my opinion and things change and I reserve the right to change my mind. Above all else, do your own analysis and think for yourself because in the end, you are the only person who is going to look out for your best interests.